Okay, so today is Friday, November 6th, and this is ECE 641 and uh, model-based imaging. And today we're going to do our third lecture on the EM algorithm, which is, uh, so on the first lecture, I was really talking about the philosophy or the intuition, right? Then the second lecture, I derived sort of the core theory, the equations. And now, on this lecture, what I want to do is talk about how you actually apply that theory for some specific problems. And I think the first one we want to do is the EM algorithm for Gaussian mixtures, okay? Which leads to sort of a classic clustering kind of a strategy. And the equations get kind of nasty. So I think what I'll probably end up doing is just projecting the, the notes up on the screen and we kind of walk through them, right? Because if I have to write them all out on the board, I'm not sure you'll get a whole lot more out of it, okay? And then once we suffer through that, then I'm gonna introduce sort of a shortcut for how to do these problems, okay? And then, uh, okay, so maybe, so what I wanna first do is I wanna go back and I wanna kind of review what we learned Okay, which is that, what did we learn? So, we learned that, so EM, oh, EM theory, theory, right? That's how you spell theory. And EM stands for expectation maximization, right? This was originally called the Baum-Welch algorithm. Uh, so a guy named, I guess, Baum and Welch, but I think it was mostly Baum, they were doing kind of speech processing and they needed to train hidden Markov models. So they developed this algorithm, Baum-Welch, I think it was like the late 60s. Hey, Greg. Hey. And um, they uh, published it. And then a bunch of statisticians republished it and called it the EM algorithm. And, uh, and then there's sort of like a, a folk theory that, that well, the baum welsh algorithm was only for the special case of, of hidden Markov models. But if you actually read the paper, that's totally not true at all. It was completely the general case. And it's just, so the moral of that story is if you're going to invent something, make sure you're the last person to invent it, OK? <laughs> Okay, I just have to say that because everybody cites the recent references. It's really sad. I'm sure, I suspect, I don't know. I don't want to, that whoever, the original people who did the original work have, are not here anymore, you know. But, uh, but still, uh, so what happens is you have the log of P of Y given theta, okay? So the idea is that you have y, this is an observation, you have x, which is, is uh, sort of, uh, this it's unavailable, it's an unavailable, unobserved, unobserved. Uh, thing, okay, and then theta is parameters. And we have, so the model is going to be, uh, or is going to be that P of Y, uh, usually there's like, you know, P of Y X given theta, right? But the problem is we don't know x. So, so this is the um, this is this is sometimes called the incomplete data. And this is and together the two things are called the complete data. So 
So if you have the complete dative, usually the, the idea is, the, it doesn't have to be, but the uh, concept is that if you had the complete data, the problem would be relatively easy. Solving the maximum likelihood estimator, if you have y and x together, is easy. But you don't have the complete data. You only have the incomplete data, y. So the natural thing, which is sort of like eh, a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, it sounds a little bit, you know, not completely on the up and up, OK? is that somehow you use y to estimate x. Then you pretend you know x, right? And then, then, then you plug in your estimate of x from y, and then you do the maximum likelihood estimator then, right? But the problem with that is that that's really cheating, right? You're cheating. I mean, if you use, if you have y and then you try to estimate x, and then you pretend that was your actual observed x, and then you estimate theta from the, you completed the data by filling in the missing blanks, okay? And then you, when the complete data, you tried to solve the problem. Okay, fine, well that works. I mean, look, I'm not gonna complain in the sense that, look, I'm an engineer. Uh, most of the people here are engineers, I guess, okay? And as an engineer, I'm proud to make whatever approximation is necessary to get the job done, okay? Okay, I take pride in that. I mean, you know, the, as long as the rocket goes up and it, there's, no, it, there's no problems, I'm good, okay? Now, maybe the rocket weighed a little more than it needed to or burned a little more fuel, but it didn't blow up, so I'm happy, okay? So, as an engineer, you've got to make approximations. But, on the other hand, if somebody can come to you and give you a better answer that's, that's right, that's closer to right, then sure, I'll use that, okay? I'm very pragmatic. I'd like to have the best answer I can get given whatever resources I have to expend in terms of computation or whatever. So this kind of, this thing where I would just plug in an x from a known y, try to guess at x from y, and then do it, okay, that's a little, eh, you know, not so good. But I'll do it if I have to. But can I do something better? Well, the EM algorithm gives you a better way to do it, okay? And the way it works, then, is that you have Q of theta, theta prime plus H of theta, theta prime, okay? And, and Q is where the action is, okay? Q is the thing, what's effectively going to happen is you're going to replace the log likelihood with this Q function. And it's going to turn out that this Q function is a surrogate function for this log likelihood, okay? Uh, so then repeated minimization of Q is going to result in, in the solution. So the EM algorithm the EM algorithm looks like this. Uh, it's just really simple. Right? You just repeatedly maximize Q. Now, every time you maximize Q, what really happens, I'm writing this as a function of theta and theta prime, but it's a little bit uh, misleading in the sense that the theta prime is usually fixed, okay? And then we need to vary theta to this maximization. So we really need a functional form for theta, whereas for theta prime, we don't need a functional form. We could just, it's fixed, right? So what really happens is that you compute the new theta prime and then Using that theta prime, you calculate the functional form for Q as a function of theta, and then you do the maximization. So even though this looks like one step, there's really two. The first step is when you calculate the functional form of Q, and the second is when you actually do the maximization. And that's why it's EM, because the definition of Q is that Q of theta, 
theta prime is equal to the expected value of the negative log. And now, this may seem like really complicated, but once you get the idea, now I can write this down. It's not that complicated, okay? It like, looks like a long expression, but it makes sense. So what goes in here is the, like the log likelihood I would have if I had the complete data. So it's, if I had the complete data, it would be p of y x given theta, right? So if I had the complete data, but the problem is I don't have x. So instead of, now, the, the sort of the, 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 the dumb thing that could be effective to do is that I just take y, estimate a value for x, and I plug it in there. Like in the case of the fertilized plants, I took the height of each plant, I made a decision whether it was fertilized or not. I just plug it in. I pretend it's correct, and then I solve the maximum likelihood problem. In the EM algorithm, it's a little more subtle, because I know that any estimate I come up for x is going to be wrong. So instead of saying, I know x, I say, well, x maybe has some distribution. And the distribution, then I, I take the expectation over y equals little y and theta prime. So what happens here is I guess what the parameters are. I use my guess of the parameters to com compute the condition, the posterior distribution of x given the parameters. And then I take the expectation of this log likelihood. Now, if the, if the posterior distribution of x is highly peaked, then there's one value of x which is much more likely than the other values of x then it becomes essentially the same thing as just plugging in my guess for x. But if there's a lot of uncertainty in what x should be, then this is, could be very different because it averages those things, right? Now, there's also the other thing, h. h uh, is a little different. It's equal to the expected value of what? Minus the log of p of x, uh, right, I better write it down because I'll end up writing the wrong thing. Yeah, p of x given y. Okay, and the important thing that we showed is that for all theta and theta prime, um, h of theta, theta prime is greater than or equal to the h of theta prime, theta prime, okay? Which is, um, means that if, if theta prime's fixed, because theta prime is usually fixed, it's what I call the point of approximation, okay? If theta prime's fixed, then, then that means as a function of theta, theta prime is the minimum. So it takes on its minimum when these two variables are equal, okay? Right. Now, so if I use those two things together, I want to show this thing over here, uh, just to go through it. This is 245. Excuse me? Could you just show the definition of Q and H? No, in the, in, the, in the book itself. In the book. Oh, in the book, yeah. Let's look at it again. Right there. Let's do you want let's stare at that. I'm a big believer. What those, uh, so I think this is different from the board because here the Q has a positive log and the oh, yeah. H has a negative log. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. 
This should be, okay. And the reason I keep doing that is because I keep flipping back and forth between maximization and minimization. In the, neg in the uh, log likely, I like to do minimization, but for reasons of convention, Q is usually defined as a maximum. I mean, I guess you can define it otherwise, but you have to be a little careful. If you're reading papers in the literature, you'll get things mixed up like I just did. Okay. So, so yes, yeah, so that's Q. So we're doing maximization of Q, right? And uh, now, uh, okay. So this is the this is the line I wanted to show you. Um, let's see. So, uh, so we know that we know that the log likelihood is Q plus H, right? So, since the log likelihood is Q plus H, then if I take the difference between the log likelihood, so I have theta prime is my starting point, and theta is the new parameter, so I want to know what this change in log likelihood is. Here I'm doing maximization, so I want this to be as large as possible. So, so that's going to be equal to, uh, uh, oh, this is the result. Ignore that. <laughs> Okay, uh, hold on. I, yeah, I know it is the next line, but I, I kind of don't want, okay, maybe, I, I need to protect you. I need to protect you from, there it is. Okay, I can't, okay, well, I have no choice. Okay, sorry. Okay, I need to protect you from that information because you haven't learned it yet. Okay, so that, so that, so this is that, right? And this is that, correct? So now I just, okay, I can rearrange terms a little bit, right? So I have Q minus the Q, and I have H minus H, right? But now we've shown that this difference must be positive, or at least it can't be negative. So it's, it's non-negative, right? So consequently, then this must be greater than that. So by this logic then, I can also, I can move this term over here because that's really a constant of them. And what I'd have then is I'd have this, if I move this term over here, then everything on this side would be a surrogate function for that, right? But if you recall, I define surrogate functions a little more broadly, which is you can add any constant to a surrogate function, it remains a surrogate function. Because that just shifts it up and down. The picture isn't as pretty, because now it's not equal to the point of approximation. But it still serves the same purpose. So the point is, Q is a surrogate function. So from that, so this is, this is the result, OK? So I, here it's backwards, because I have the proof after the statement of what's true, right? But so this must be true. If I increase, the increase in Q, this is the increase in Q, lower bounds the increase in the log likelihood. If I increase Q, I must have increased the log likelihood by at least that much, right? OK, so now, now all I have to do is calculate Q and repeatedly maximize it and Okay, I would claim that, okay, once I know that's true, then uh, I know this thing has to converge. By converge, what do I mean? That I mean the log likelihood of theta has to reach a maximum, uh, has to converge, okay? It doesn't actually mean theta has to converge, <laughs> because there's a subtle distinction. Uh, the reason the log likelihood has to converge is why? Because each iteration of this, increases the value of the log likelihood, okay? Oh, okay. It's not necessarily that it has to converge, because it could go to infinity. But let's say the log likelihood is bounded above, okay? So it, it, it's easy to come up with counterexamples where the log likelihood goes to infinity, but we usually uh, fix those things up, okay? So let's assume that we don't allow the log likelihood to go to infinity. 
then if the log likelihood doesn't go to infinity, then it must converge. Because with each iteration, it's increasing. And a monotone increasing sequence that's bounded above must converge. That's one of the basic theorems you see in calculus, uh, I think, when you're a freshman. Okay? So now, will theta converge? That's a different matter. It's a more subtle issue. But usually the answer is yes. From an engineering perspective, yes. <laughs> it will converge, okay? Because it's got to do something, right? So, it, it'll, it, you'll, so what, will you get to a global maximum? Not necessarily, okay? Because it might get trapped in a local minimum, a maximum, right? But, but it'll at least converge to a, a local maximum, okay? And now, um, okay, now, um, so, uh, so right, so that's the algorithm. So now the question is, how do we apply it? This is all very nice, but it seems kind of abstract, right? So, and there are some additional results. Uh, let's see, so, oh, Q is a surrogate function for the log likelihood, and, uh, okay, that's good. Now, okay, Gaussian mixtures. Um, so Gaussian mixture, so what is a mixture? Let me um, just talk about what a mixture is first. Okay, so Gaussian mixtures. Okay, so what happens is you have X is a member of um, zero through M minus one, so it's discrete. And the probability that X equals M is equal to pi M, okay? And then, uh, then uh, the conditional distribution of uh, Y, uh, or I'll, maybe I'll write it like this. So the distribution of Y, given that X uh, equals M, is distributed as uh, normal with mean mu M and sigma M squared. Or let's say in, in the general case, this would be multivariant, so it would be R. M. So this could be a multivariate random variable. So the idea is that M indexes a set of, of, of parameters, a set of, it's, it's a set of M means and a set of M covariances. So uh, theta then is equal to, uh, it's the parameter for the multivariate district, for the uh, the uh, Gaussian mixture distribution, it's got uh, pi zero, then it has mu zero, and it has r zero, right? Then it has pi one, mu one, r one. And this continues until it gets pi m minus one, mu m minus one, r m minus 1. Oops, it's an ordered pair, so I'll put it like this. Okay? So, um, so that's the parameter vector for the multivariate, uh, for the Gaussian mixture distribution. And the intuition behind this is that um, you have a bunch of uh, things. This is like n mu 0 r 0. And this is n mu m minus 1. Uh, this is n mu m minus 1, r m minus 1. I should have made those boxes the same size. And 
in. And each of these generates random variables with that appropriate distribution. And then there's like a switch. And the switch is controlled by x. Each of these, this becomes a, a, what you might call y0. And this is y m minus 1. This is how you actually generate a Gaussian mixture. Now, the distribution of a Gaussian mixture is uh, the probability density, p of y, uh, uh, given theta, is equal to the sum from uh, m equals 0 to m minus 1 of p of y given mu m r m times, uh, we'll make this pi m, like that. So in practice, if you add Gaussian random variables, if you add two Gaussian random variables, what's the distribution of the resulting random variable? It's, it's what? It's Gaussian, right? But if you add the density functions of two Gaussian random variables, What's the distribution? It, it, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the distribution, right? So it looks like this. And they don't have to be the same variance or mean or amplitude. So it's a Gaussian mixture. The answer to is Gaussian mixture, actually. So Gaussian mixture is the general description of what happens when you, now you can't add the dis distrib densities literally, like sum them, because then they wouldn't be a, dens a density anymore. Because if you take two density functions, you add them, the function you get doesn't integrate to one anymore. So, so it has to be a weighted sum, and the weights have to themselves sum to one, and they have to be positive because if they weren't non, uh, they have to be non-negative. If they weren't non-negative, then the distribution you get would be, if they were, if some of them were negative, well, I mean, okay, I want to be careful. I, I, if they're non-negative, then you're guaranteed that this is a distribution. I mean, you could do something weird where you subtract the two things, and, but okay. So these have to be positive to ensure that this is positive. Okay. Now, uh, interestingly, you can really model any distribution with some level of accuracy with these things, right? Because if you, okay, as an engineer, I should have preface it by saying as an engineer. As an engineer, you can model any distribution with some level of accuracy with a bunch of these little blobs, okay? In fact, sometimes in, uh, they call these things, um, uh, what do they call these things? Uh, in uh, machine learning, they have a name for that. Oh, excuse me? Uh, they haven't. What is the name I'm looking for? Um, when they take little Gaussians and they they uh, they d model the distribution. Of, they model the a function with the sum of little Gaussian functions. I can't remember it right now. Okay. The Gaussian process? No. Uh, like they they do it with kernel tricks and things. Uh, so yeah, but they have. Uh, it'll come to me. But they, they model functions as, by modeling them as sums of little Gaussian um, functions, OK? And um, yeah, but it's not quite that. I'm looking for another term. It'll come to me. But anyway, uh, so you can, to some approximation, model any distribution. So the power of Gaussian mixtures is you, yeah, OK. It may, the way I motivate it is that it's actually caused by the fact that, that you, know, you have different uh, classes of events which have different behaviors. And that uh, then you're randomly selecting between the different behavior states. 
and you see this. But the other way of thinking about it is that it's a completely uh, mathematical construct, okay? That there is no true underlying uh, discrete states here. There's just some distribution that you're trying to model, okay? It's some kind of smooth distribution. And you try to get them a fit. So you can fit this by fitting it together with a bunch of these things. They add together, okay? I'm making this up, of course. And if you add these together, it won't be perfect. But as you get more and more of these Gaussian components, it's the order of the model. So K, uh, M, this is called the order of the model. As the order of the model goes toward, towards infinity, you should be able to get a good fit to any distribution. Is it yeah. spline? Excuse me? Is it a spline? Well, no. Oh, is the word I'm thinking about spline? No. It's really annoying me. I'm going to have radial basis functions. <laughs> Uh, okay, radio. Oh, sorry, I blurted that out. <laughs> okay, radial basis functions. Okay, Irradi that's what radial basis functions are. They have these little Gaussian things, and they fit them together. So you can fit, and this is in multi dimensions, of course, too. Now the problem may be that uh, this is a nice idea, but you might be, need an awful lot of these. Okay. <laughs> But then again, in these days of millions and millions of parameters, there used to be a guy named Carl Sagan, and he was like billions and billions of parameters, okay? <laughs> so and you have billions and billions of parameters. You know, what the heck? Maybe it's, you can do that. And people are very really interested in that. And you've seen a lot, there's been a lot of recent literature, relatively recent. It's, everything's been displaced by deep neural networks, but it'll come back again, okay? Because there was a lot of wor work on doing multidimensional uh, approximation of distributions using Gaussian mixtures. They're very powerful because they represent a general representation of any non-Gaussian distribution. But they sort of inherit a lot of the properties of Gaussians because their components are Gaussian, okay? So it's a very interesting and powerful idea. But the question is, how do you fit it? Oh, one of the points here is that I shouldn't have raised that maybe, is that you can't do that intuitive thing here, okay? That's not gonna work. I mean, the intuitive thing worked fine when the distributions were completely separate, okay? Then everything's fine. Okay, I fit one here and one here. But if I have some distribution that looks like this. Okay? Well, how do I fit that with Gaussians? So if I just try to, I don't know, chop it up into pieces or something and fit each piece with a Gaussian, I mean, it's not going to work that well, right? It's not going to be a very good fit. But if I, the maximum likelihood estimate says find this overall parameter for the whole distribution that will fit that. So, so Gaussian mixtures are a way of modeling arbitrary distributions in high dimensional spaces. And the EM algorithm is going to be the way, or a way, really probably the best way. Well, best, that's too strong. Okay. It's the most widely used way, certainly, for fitting uh, the parameters of the Gaussian mixture to real data. Okay. So how does it work? So that's kind of the motivation. Now, uh, I think what I'm going to do is this. So this is when it gets really ugly. And um, I think what I'll do is this. I'll just walk through it like this, because otherwise, if I try to do it on the board, it'll be horrible. So, uh, so this is, oops, there's a few sort of little tricks you have to learn here. So this is the parameter that describes the Gaussian mixture distribution. OK, now we're going to start off by looking at Oh, okay. Well, okay, so what's my goal here? I want to compute the Q function. Okay, so to compute the Q function, I'm first going to need to know the log probability of the complete data. 
Okay, and to do that, there's a sequence. Now, one thing that's a little confusing is that you have a sequence of uh, so there's there's a you have x and y. The x and the y come in pairs because the x is the label and the y is the data. So you have like x zero and y zero. I like to draw an arrow because y depend the distribution of y depends on x. Then you have x one and you have y one, right? And then finally you have x m minus one and you have y m minus one. Actually, maybe on my do I start at zero or do I start at one? Zero and m minus one. Oh I did. Okay, right. Oh, but that's in class. Okay. Okay, here, yeah. This is one. This is one. Two. Okay, you're gonna say, well, why am I starting at one if I start the class at zero? There's a reason, okay? This is two. This is two. This is n. This is n. Because this is time. Now, in this particular case, it's not really time because I could have reordered them. Okay? But I ordered them just so I could do the counting. And so I think of this as time. Later, it actually will be time because we'll have a state dependence when we have hidden Markov models. And that's why I start at one because in hidden Markov models, state zero is the initial condition. Okay? But the, each of these things itself takes on different states. So the point that's important to keep in mind is M indexes the state and N indexes time. So right now we're computing the joint probability of X and Y at a single time but across states, okay? Now, okay, so then, so that's fine. So, so I can write this distribution as, okay, the probability of X and Y together is the probability of Y given X times the probability of X. The probability of Y given X, I told you, it's conditional, conditionally Gaussian. And its conditional mean is Xn, is, is a mu of Xn, and, okay, sigma Xn. Now this is confusing, I think. Because Xn is the label, that's the discrete label. But you have to index mu by the discrete label because that tells you which mu to use. Right, does that make sense? Okay, so that takes it, now, this is really funky here. You're gonna say, why did I bother doing this? And later you're gonna see why, but you just have to believe me for that, okay? Instead of writing it this simple way, I write it this more complicated way, okay? I say, look, if I sum over all the states, and I use a delta function, the delta function is only one when x is equal to m, right? So, if I sum this, I get the same answer as this, okay? And I'm taking the log, so the log is the log of this time plus the log of that, so I've expanded it out. Now, most of these terms are zero, because what ends up happening is that xn is some value, and the only term that's not zero is the one where uh, m is equal to xn. So this is a, like a lot of stuff that's mostly all zero, but it's handy, it's gonna come in handy in just a minute, okay? Now, so what happens is then, if I look at the sequence in time, now, the sequence I'm assuming is they're independent in time. That's why there's no connection between these circles. Each one's independent. So the log probability of the sequence of x and y's together is the sum of the log probability of each individual case. Because when things are independent, uh, the logs of the probabilities add, okay? Because they're independent, then the probability of the sequence is the product of the probabilities of each individual case, right? Yeah. Now, I plug in that thing up there for this, and then I get, so that single sum over m now becomes a double sum. 
This is a sum over state, and it's also a sum over time. The sum over time takes into account that the events at each time are independent. Any questions about that? Now, now this is where the action really occurs, okay? So I want to compute the Q function. So this is the definition of the Q function. But now I'm, I'm ready because I got this, this thing computed. So I, I start plugging that in. And the important thing in this situation is to be fearless, okay? You can't let the complexity of the expressions get you upset, okay? You just remain calm and continue computing, okay? It's sort of like what they say in Britain. What is it? Be calm, um, be calm and carry on, okay? So I plug that into here, okay? Now, everything's fine. I, I, it takes me a while to settle down because it looks a little complicated. But then I look at it and I go, well, nothing's too horrible here. I just got a big mess over here. But expectation's linear. So I can take the sum out of the expectation, right? The only thing that needs to stay inside the expectation is anything that's random. Y is not random. Mu and sigma are not random. Pi is not random. The only thing that's random here is x. So everything else can go out, OK? So now I just have this. The expectation is this. So now, it's important to remain calm. What is this, what does this mean? This is the expected value of a delta function. This delta function is one when x is equal to m. And it's zero otherwise. So what does that mean? Okay. Yeah, so let me ask you this. If I have um, the expected value of delta of, of x equals 3, what's that equal to? It's the probability that x equals 3. By the way, that's why expectation is fundamental. It's actually more fundamental than density functions, right? You can build everything from expectation in probability, OK? So this is just the conditional probability that xn equals m. It's the probability density function for xn. It's, but it's the posterior distribution of xn given y and, th and assuming theta prime is the parameter, OK? So, so this is what it is, OK? Now look at this. What is this? This is the Q function, remember. The Q function is the all-important function. This is the Q function. It looks like just the log likelihood. This would have been the normal log likelihood, OK? If you knew, if you knew x. But instead, you've computed the conditional, you've weighted it, you've weighted each term. Like each term here is the, is the log likelihood assuming that you knew y and x. X is encoded in the fact that of m. M is, the value of this index m is x, right? But instead I've taken an average of these terms weighted by the probability, the posterior probability, that x is equal to m. So it's a soft averaging. Okay, it's a soft averaging. Now, if I, if, now I don't, I skip some stuff here because it gets too ugly. Now, oh, I know. If you actually compute, you know what this is. This is a Gaussian, so you know, you can write out the explicit form. And this is what you actually get. So, if you were doing maximum likely estimation of mu and sigma, you would just maximize this thing here, right? You'd maximize that thing, or you'd min minimize its negative. But instead, you take a weighted average, weighted by the probability that x is equal to m. Now, if you then, so I can simplify the notation 
by, by defining a function. This function is the probability distribution. Uh, this is the probability distribution of m given y and x. So this is the posterior probability uh, that x is equal to m given this. And uh, I'm, uh, I know we're done now. So, so, and I can actually write that in closed form. Maybe next time I'll go over this in a little more detail. This, can, this is easy to calculate. You just apply Bayes' rule. It looks like a complicated formula, but the concept is really pretty straightforward. You're just applying Bayes' rule to calculate the posterior probability of each label. OK. So now what happens is this. Now when you compute, now what happens is this. Um, you compute, uh, so now in order to compute the update, oh, I erased it. I'll go over this next time. Then why did you compute the Q function in the first place? You computed the Q function because you want to maximize it with respect to theta, right? If you, if you maximize this with respect to theta, what is theta? Theta is the mu's, the sigma's, OK? If you maximize this with respect to the mu's and the sigma's and the pi's, it's basically the same calculation you did before. Because the only thing that's different is that you're weighting this sum. So the outcome you get is very similar, OK? And the outcome is this. OK, you, you'd have to go through the calculation of doing Remember, in the section one, you actually, in chapter one, I had you calculate the maximum leg estimates and for a ga multivariate Gaussian distribution. You went through the grinding. The answer is the same. N now is the sum of the S. That N has the interpretation of being the number of, of samples that fall into each class. But this is like the average American family having 2.3 children, okay, or 1.7 children, or whatever it is, okay? Obviously, there's no 0.7 children, but here there is, because what happens is that you can have fractional membership into the different classes, okay? This now tells you the, the this tells you the, prob, the posterior probability, or the prior probability, that, that uh, if something is from a particular class because it gives you the ratio of the number of samples in each class to the total number of samples. This is the number of samples in time. We'll go over this again, because I know it's a little bit much at this point. Mu now is like the average, but instead of it being the regular average, it's a weighted average. <laughs> OK? And sigma squared here is now, instead of the regular variance, it's a variance formed by a weighted. So the, uh, let me show you this one picture, and then I'll, I'll be done. Because um, I think this picture sort of helps to illustrate it. The idea is that you have all these observations, right? You assign the observations to one of the, you, the, the over here are the bin, the buckets, associated with the different classes. So the number of classes is different than the number of the observations. This is time, and this is class. So you might have 1,000 samples, each of which fall into 10 classes, OK? So each one belongs to every class to some degree. But it tends to mostly belong to one or two classes, say. Then within each of these clusters, you do an averaging, OK? Uh, you, 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 you use an averaging to compute the estimated values of mean, variance, and, and, and probability of falling into here. And then once you have those new parameters, you go back here and reclassify. Uh, so the idea is that the way this algorithm actually works is you iterate between Reclassification and, and re-estimation. Reclassification, re-estimation. Reclassification, re-estimation, until you reach convergence. And you know you have to reach convergence. Where's the actual algorithm here? Somewhere. Uh, maybe I missed it. You know you have to reach convergence because uh, each step of this algorithm, OK, uh, I guess this is, I know, don't worry about it. Uh, each step of this algorithm, um, each step in this algorithm increases the log likelihood. So if the log likelihood is bounded above, you can't just go off into space, OK? 
So that's the email algorithm. Read the notes, and then I'll go over it in more detail, and then I'll also explain how we kind of have a shortcut so we don't have to go through all these calculations every time we go to uh, uh, derive the email algorithm updates, okay? All right, bye, and have a nice weekend. Bye.